welcome to our first episode ever of Bookish Banter. This will be a monthly uh, monthly podcast as we discuss, usually I think we're going to discuss fiction, uh, some kind of classic literature on occasion, maybe some nonfiction. My normal co-host will be Colin here. So Hello. 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 Uh, for Let's our first episode, after- though. Yeah, Dostoevsky once said that beauty could save the world. Discuss. Talk amongst yourselves. What does that mean? Luckily, I don't think I ever want to read any Dostoevsky. So... Oh, well, I that's a shame. That's okay. We'll do it on <laughs> we'll do those episodes on my channel because yeah, holy crap. Those Russians knew how to write, but yes. Our first book for this month is uh Don DeLillo's I'm not sure if you want to call it Mao Two or Mao the Second. It's stylized as Mao the Second. So, I, um, because I'm radically dyslexic, I actually mostly listened to this uh, book. Uh, Audio book is actually how, how I do a lot of my reading while I'm running. Um, I do long distance runs and I listen to books, um, which is the most autistic right wing Twitter thing you've ever heard. But that's fine. It's just me. Um, so they, so the audiobook reader said Mao too, because it's based on a, uh, Warhol painting. So, right. or Warhol art. So, and I believe, so that's how it was pronounced in the audiobook. Now, that's not to say that's a canon pronunciation, but I was like, oh, interesting. The, that's apparently, if it, if it is a, we might have to, I haven't looked into that. If it's a Warhol, it, since it is a Warhol painting, that might actually be the name of the painting, yes. which I would say is probably the name of the book, but we're very pomo here. So I don't know if it even matters. I, I don't know. For some reason, I call it Mao the second because when I the see air of Mao, well, when I see the um, uh, as it's stylized on the on the cover, I see the, the Roman numerals, and so I I uh, internalize yeah. that as the second, right? Like I King think of Henry it as the second. I think it was Mao two attack of the Maos, <laughs> and in this one, there's just a lot of Mao clones running around, and they removed Jar Jar, so it's better. Oh Lord, um, I kind of want to jump into the writing first. Uh, so before we hit the themes and, and the, the content of the book, you have said you're not a fan of Don DeLillo. So I didn't say I would. Well, OK, well, finish your point and then I will. You've already mischaracterized me, but continue with your with your with your with your point. The first novel that I read by Don DeLillo was White Noise, and it's one of my favorite novels because it's just absolutely absurd in its own way. And I appreciate white noise more than this one. We'll say I I can agree with that because uh, part of that is uh, the, the writing in, in, in white noise is it's so, I mean, I can't even think of a better word than absurd, which I just It's absurdist. It's absurdist literature for sure. Yeah. But it's making a very, very, very fun and important point. Well, lots of fun and important points and doing so masterfully i thought um this book however is a little, quite different but it still has that absurdist lens to it if you will um it's still definitely a delillo book but it is different in the way he's written it because instead of instead of intertwining a bunch of themes uh flawlessly as he did in white noise this is kind of like hitting you over the head through, you know, over and over again with kind of the same two themes, um, not so subtly. So th- that I can understand it, it. It does not do its job as, as effectively as white noise did, but I'll let you, I'll let you say no, what you want to say about his writing. That, that's pretty good. No, no, it's, it's not that I dislike the little, it's just, he does not spark joy, which is strange to me. He's not supposed to. <laughs> just, metaphorically speaking does not spark joy which is strange to me because i do like i think on paper actually i am more of a fan of absurdist literature than you are maybe i've mischaracterized your reading interests but i love camus and who does not explore the the absurd if not camus Mm -hmm. and i love love and hopefully we will do some of it on this show kafka love 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 kafka um who's like absurd maybe qua absurd i mean like waking up one morning as a as a, as a beetle uh it's not that delillo is not doing that he is doing that i can appreciate that i just it does not spark joy it doesn't mean i didn't get anything out of the novel you should read things that do not spark joy right like yes. you should read all sorts of things so what i'm trying it was good it was good for me to 
to be like, oh, this ain't, this is no white noise. That's fine. Keep reading because, um, you'll get something out of it. It's not that I didn't get anything out of it. It's just, that's just an aesthetic thing for me. Like I can recognize that's purely subjective, Colin. D- just, and I don't even know why I, 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 it wasn't so, uh, hitting it for me, but it just wasn't. But well, it's and, interesting. And one last thing about the writing style that I want to get your opinion on before we jump into the plot and the themes of it, the meager plot that is. I found this to be still very masterful in the way that he writes in as much as, so there are four main characters, right? The writing style is such that whenever he jumps, because it's, it's third person omniscient is what we would call that, right? Uh, you're seeing the thought process of all four of these characters intertwined. As he jumps from one character to another, his writing style reflects that character that you're reading about. Right. Yeah. So the the uh, the the I guess the main main character Bill Gray, the uh, the author the the novelist, and when when it's when it's his point of view, everything's very uh, long paragraphs, long sentences, very like uh, almost deep in in what in what uh, absurdly strangely shallow slash deep at the same time. Um as it goes on. But then when you switch over to someone like Karen, who again, well, I'll get into who these people are in a second. You switch over to someone like Karen, who's a very surface level, shallow character and who views the world in very snip short snippets instead of deep thinking, you know, uh, tropes. His writing style changes, right? His writing style is very short, sweet, snips, you know, not even whole sentences sometimes. And I have to appreciate that because as I was reading, I was like, okay, this is clearly this character, right? Um, I, I didn't even have to think, wait, who am, who am I reading about right now? It, it was very clear by the writing style. So I guess I wanted to get your sort of opinion on that. Uh, it's a good point. I, um, again, I experience, <laughs> literature oftentimes differently because I don't always read it. I'm oftentimes listening to it. And so in a novel like this, it could get theoretically get confusing who is talking, mm-hmm. but the style did shift enough to where I was usually able, like while listening or running while running or doing something else to, to figure out who was talking. And so it is interesting. And this is a sort of a Russian doll effect of nesting stories within other stories, um, which is not unique to DeLillo, but I think, yeah, no, I mean, <clears throat> I'm not hating on DeLillo. I think it's, I could not have written something like this, but it just, wow. yeah, it's just, it's, uh, it's, or would you want to, <laughs> I probably wouldn't want to, but, um, yeah, no, well, like that. So yeah, no, the style is, it's just, it's, um, he's doing what he's doing. Well, it just, it's, it's not, uh, I, I feel like it for me, I think maybe part of it is that for me to really dig absurdist literature, it has to be a little bit more absurd. I think it was almost too yeah. real in a way and so uh, it, it 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 it's a it's it's absurd in that way that real life is absurd but not in that way that you get sometimes um in other examples of the of the genre so yeah this i think it for me is a novel all about the <clears throat> strange middle grounds between things mm-hmm. and it's not that there's not tension there but it's not as pronounced and so maybe it just it wasn't as exciting maybe that's why but we've devolved completely into book club here. So let's start actually talking about like not how yes. we feel because yes. that's feelings are fake. And facts don't care about your feelings. So let's. Um, and there's a reason I started with this. So, yeah, we'll we'll jump into the plot and the yeah. themes here. Uh, I, I added all of this at the beginning for the reason of saying from here on out, spoiler alert, if you have not read this book and want to. Spoilers. Yeah. Based off of the little conversation that you just heard, you know press pause, come back after you've read it, something like that. But uh, if you have no uh, desire to go read the book yourself, listen on and we'll discuss and and give you the highlights. So basically this book, um, my criticism of this book in its, in its entirety is the fact that it has basically no plot. Yeah. There's a very small amount of plot. And and a lot of people who've written criticisms about this have said the same thing. So basically the small plot that runs through it, is Bill Gray is a novelist uh, who's a reclusive, right? He doesn't, uh, he lives in a small un, undisclosed place and he's been working on a novel for probably decades, it seems. 
Uh, he's been revising it, rewriting it, all of this stuff on a, on a typewriter, nonetheless. And he finally decides to sort of open his home to one person. And that one person is a photographer who's obsessed with the, the photographer is obsessed with ph photographing um, writers and novelists. And that became her kind of raison d'etre. Uh, so she comes into the household, which is uh, Bill Gray, the novelist, his assistant, who was like an, overly eager fan who like hunted him down and said, I will be your assistant. Uh, and then this strange woman that the assistant brought with him who came from a cult, uh, the Moonies actually. So yeah, they are just, it's objectively yeah. the Moonies. Right. Exactly. So what, what's his name? Uh, the Reverend Sun Young Moon. Yeah. I believe that's that. Yeah. He was the cult leader and she, the most absurd part of the whole book was the the opening, I think. The mass marriage at Yankee Stadium uh of the Moonies. Uh I, I I laughed a little bit as I read as I read that opening uh section. I was like, where the hell is this going? What is what is going on here? Um but it was it was an interesting tie in uh because at the very end of the opening section, uh Delillo quotes Mao in one of his most famous sayings, apparently, not that I know Mal, the future belongs to crowds, right? So that's the very last sentence of the opening section. And that is one of the main themes of the book, right? Crowds. It I have a lot to say about that, if you'll, if you'll permit. I, yeah, it comes up over and, over, the, and over again. That's one of the, that's one of the themes, the things that actually did com was compelling for me about the book. So it's one of the things that I kept reading. Well, this is where it gets to me this theme is is slightly political. So this is the first theme I wanted to talk about slightly. is crowds. Slightly. Yeah, okay. Very political, but slightly political for me in, in that I made the connection of uh, Rand, right? So Rand, Ayn Rand talks a lot about individualism versus collectivism. And that has been a huge thing in my sort of political awakening is uh, the left in in the world and in the in especially in this country is all about collectivism uh, I don't care what you think as an individual. I don't care about your individual rights. It's what's best for everyone. And if not, not only what's best for everyone, what's best for the least of us is good for everyone, if that makes sense. And so this, this is really getting into that idea of collectivism and, uh, crowds reacting and, and, loving and hating and, and wailing. And I mean, it, it shows crowds of all aspects in this novel um, reacting in different ways. So uh, yeah, you, you go for it. And uh, I'll yeah, probably well, have something to say about what you say. Yeah. I have something to say about it. I don't go to Rand. I'm actually not a Rand fan. Uh, it's fine mm -hmm. if you are, but I'm not really, I, I think I'm not a huge fan of hers um, for reasons that are beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. Um, <clears throat> but no, for me, it's the, the, um, I go way more like uh, esoteric stuff. I mean, with this, the crowd thing, particularly the first section, we're talking to, like with the, the strange staccato style description of the mass marriage ceremony and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, egregores, collective intelligences, uh, how people get swept up into, uh, you know, how, how various intel individual intelligences are smooshed together or however you want to conceive of that into collective intelligences and then how those intelligences aka here we'll say crowds drive people to do things um drive people to do things that maybe they would have done by themselves maybe they wouldn't do by themselves but they are essentially um i mean everyone defines egregores a little differently but the idea is that right the term comes out of uh, uh western esotericism that you have like its idea of these you know spirits that watch over groups uh, essentially so um whether or not they're objectively spiritually true or not is not even important for what we're talking about here but the idea is that you know you can have enough people people this just happens whether you know even from a, mat a strictly materialist perspective even if you get enough people together and they have some sort of shared identity or purpose they will start acting in ways that um they probably wouldn't individually and that does not have to be bad it doesn't have to be bad it could be bad it could just be what it is. It also could be good, but it is a thing that happens with humans. And um, I think that the idea of, you know, the 
future belongs to crowds. The future belongs to uh, the way I interpret that is. And I don't think DeLillo would take this 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 route at all, but that's fine. Uh, we're like Roland Barthes around here. We just kill authors left and right. Um, anyone? That's funny. Come on. It actually was pretty stupid, but that's pretty funny. Uh, um, a French, a French theorist. I'm trying to speak to my colleague here. Um, but, but like the future belongs to crowds because it's always belonged to collective intelligences. And I think we, this is my interpretation of this, uh, again, which is the author would, would probably not share. And I don't think even you, Mitch, will share, but that humans, we've convinced ourselves in the modern era that we have individuality. And I'm not saying we don't, but that the individual is the only thing that matter or matters. Now, whether or not you believe in that is is sort of beside the point. The reality, though, I think that a lot of people are figuring out is that um, you are an individual, but you belong to things and you cannot extricate yourself from those things. And if you try to, what will happen is other group identities will take their place and will drive you to do things. And I think it's safe to say that in it's become very clear to people in recent years, maybe the past three years specifically, but even maybe a little bit more, or a little bit less, depending, um, that that you, it, there's inescapable collective intelligences, that crowds are a thing. Now, the question is probably maybe more about what is the crowd making you do? And uh, and is the crowd moving away from good things or towards bad things or these kinds of things that that is an important thing to keep in mind. of. So this idea of the future belongs to crowds. Maybe it was always part of the crowds. Maybe maybe crowds was always part of the future, rather. Um, and I think that's why this really classifies in some ways as a postmodern novel, because it's it's moving past this modern hyper modernist notion of intel of 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 individualism as the good, the only good in existence. And I if you i think in some ways it it it, it critiques that because if you do that well you get people who are individuals and they say well i'm an individual i'm disconnected from everything all tradition what am i going to do i'm going to join the moonies find a new tradition by the way they make me <laughs> marry somebody i just met and drive around the country selling flowers and that's my new individual identity even though it's really not individual at all it's collective but it's a it's a negative it's a it's a it's a detrimental kind of uh, of collective intelligence i could keep going i'll shut up but that's that's a thing that now that's very much my interpretation of this but i do think it holds i think it accounts for this and i think delillo is is less interested in the weird esoteric qualities of it and is just more i think critiquing how new identities are created and then almost instantly become entrenched because humans desperately want collective identities. So I think. But I don't think, I don't think he's making any value judgment about collectivism or crowds versus individual, right? Because I think he's just exploring it. Exactly. Because the whole point of, that's my, but my judgment is it's bad. So the, again, that's, that's my critique of, that's my okay. critique of these kinds of things. But what I, I'm, I think he's being neutral. I'm taking his neutral things and using it to, to do my own stuff with it because okay. that's how, that's how I do. Yeah. No, I, I definitely think he's intellectual being, street fighter style. So he's definitely being neutral in that we have a, we have again, a very reclusive character in the, in the novelist, Bill Gray. Um, the other two, so Karen, the Mooney, who was extracted from the crowd of the cult by... Um... And then how did they get her out of the cult? They actually, they deprogram. So they come talk about, one of the things I love too, is they talk about how cult deprogramming, DeLillo makes this point right. in the book, that cult, cult deprogramming is actually just more cult programming. <laughs> you're just no no they make he yeah, makes yeah, that yeah. point now he yeah, makes that right. point in the in the guise of the character of karen so maybe this is not his point but it does it matter um right is this is it matter what delillo's point is or does it matter what the story tells us i very much tend towards the latter when i do literary criticism um it is a good point that to get people out of cult-like behaviors you essentially introduce new cult-like behaviors um people this makes people feel uncomfortable because it. We like to think of ourselves as complete as having arrived at all of our conclusions, very much quote unquote on our own and of our own volition, as if that's how anything in human society has ever worked. It's patently false, in my opinion. And so she, but she notices this. 
she doesn't, as you pointed out, she's not super introspective and doesn't kind of follow that rabbit hole. It's just kind of like, oh, isn't that interesting? I guess I'll be reprogrammed this other way. I was programmed one way, program me back, quote unquote back. Right. Um, but, but it is interesting because like programming is a kind of cultivation of something. It's, and that's the, you know, cult culture, a cult. We talk about cults as if they're a negative thing because oftentimes they can be. But we talk about culture as this positive things because oftentimes it can be. But it's the same root. It's the same idea. Yeah. Um, and so I like that DeLillo throws that out there. I would, of course, for me, somebody with my interests, obviously, would be like, no, give me more of that. And then it just moves on. But that's fine. It's not the point of his. It's his novel, right? It's not my novel. Right. But I do like that that was pointed out because – um. Yeah, the, the the idea that you can deprogram somebody from a cult and not put something back in its place or replace it with something is crazy. It just won't work. Right, right. But again, him him treating this idea of of individualism and crowds as as a neutral like kind of what is better. It, you have a reclusive author who is kind of like done with the reclusive life in that he ventures out to get some more fame that he's apparently been missing um he he goes to try to help this um uh, swiss author swiss poet uh get released as a hostage and is clearly doing it for uh self-serving reasons he's not really interested in the hostage i don't think um but again, he's vent- he's he's going from a reclusive state and venturing out into the world, and we see that where that leads to, it leads to his death, right? Um, versus Scott and Karen, Karen who went out and she explored New York City at one point because she was looking for Bill who went missing. Um, she goes into the park where she sees all the homeless people, and it almost seems like I almost felt like she was going to just start living with them, like almost like this was yeah. her new cult. But she realized that this isn't where she was meant to be. This isn't what she wanted. And she goes back to the more reclusive lifestyle, individual lifestyle with Scott, whom I think she probably loves at some, in some capacity. Um, so yeah, I don't think that he treats uh, collectivism versus individualism in, in any type of positive or negative. He just, uses it as a backdrop to have conversation no and i hope i hope i hope that was i hope that was clear that i wasn't i mean there i my 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 broader point is that there's this you know in a very randian sense there's this war between elect uh, individualism uh, individualism and collectivism and i'm like yeah but they're both there are good and bad parts of both of those things yeah right like individualism is not always good and it's not always bad, right? And I think right. humans tend towards one or the other, not to make everything binary. We want to escape the binary on this show. But I mean, if you look at like personality types, right? Like some tend to be more, want to be around people all the time. You know, it, you, you can you can map this onto so many different things, right? Whether you should is there may be a different question, but like introversion, extroversion, right? Like, do you want to be by yourself? Do you want to be with other people continuously? People have tendencies, but it's not like being by yourself is always great. It's not like being around other people is always great. Um, It's not like, of course, individual rights and values matter. But I mean, what is, I mean, I can't help but look around and see a lot of the degeneracy in the, in the West right now and think this is the exam. This is what happens when individualism is disconnected from any sort of traditional values at all um and so but it's there's this weird kind of it's very true i i find this on the you said this is a political perspective show so i'm going to make it political Mm -hmm. like there's an autistic tendency because most of the right at least online right is very autistic to go well it's either one or the other right so you either get like the we're literally bringing rome back bros right sort of like the neo-pagan nihilist dudes who are like we're it's literally this thing or you get like the hyper individualized Rand types. And it's like, yeah, but both of these are very, they're, they're not complete ideologies in a sense, right? Cause individualism and collectivism don't make sense and are not, are not both of both must be tempered, I think by something bigger than them. And I think that this is, again, this is why I do think this very much, you had said, Oh, this is a postmodern novel. I was like, well, maybe I'll like it. And it was okay. 
but you know it is very postmodern because it's it's i think the lilo's sort of stepping outside of both do as much as you can trying to step outside of both individualism and collectivism and just looking at them and picking them up and looking at them look, turn, look at this isn't this interesting look at this isn't this interesting again i don't think he really has a point and i don't think that's the point of the, the book i think the point is more of a meta the, a meta commentary on everything which that's at least how i'm interpreting it but um my my point is that i think something like this is useful to read because it forces you to it it gives it it forces you to to look at just to it forces you to look at how incomplete our ways of under our epistemology our way of understanding the modern world is because the modern world really can't be understood because this is sort of a broader theory that I will for sure keep bringing out when you have me on the show if you assuming you let me back hopefully you do because I think the other books that we're thinking about reading will also have this too that the modern world isn't real that it's largely fake um yeah. modernism in general is fake and so that the the post a postmodern novel like Mao too is actually the one of the most modern things you can do because it takes modernism to its logical conclusion so well and so to to tie into this conversation and lead to the next uh to point i also find it interesting that in every sense of the crowds that are evoked in the novel there's also a sense of individualism as in the crowds are surrounding and praising an individual. Right. right? So in every instance of this novel where there's a crowd, right? So we have the um, mass marriage at the beginning yep. where the, the Mooney's leader is, is the individual. Um, you, they talk a about... chunky man, a chunky man who saw Jesus on a hillside or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> When they talk about, um, they talk about Mao. I mean, obviously, the namesake of the book. Um, they talk about the Chinese people uh, and his little red book, right? But but wanting to emulate and and revere Mao. So that's a crowd loving this man. Yeah, I mean, you can't have crowds without sell without certain individuals, right? Just, you cannot have crowds qua crowds. But and then it goes as far as as to. This is the absurd part to me, to suggest that a uh, a group of terrorists in the Middle East are all of a sudden Maoist, right? So they're 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 taking hostages in the sake of you know something to Mao. I, I wasn't quite following that thread of the of the novel that closely, but it was very odd to me. Um, well, and Mao. Then, I mean, you get Maoist insurgencies all around the world. It partic- I mean, it's sort of out of date now, but well, this was written in the ninety one, so yeah. And then um, the the scene with Khomeini, right? The Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, yeah, the, the his, people, yeah. the 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 morning, the extreme morning rituals. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> so, but I, I'm going to push back on what you just said a minute ago, though. You can the 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 thought of collectivism in the in the United States. You can have crowds, as in collectivism, without having a leader, without having a central figure that that you're following. Mm, only temporarily, I would push back. I would say only temporarily. And I would say very quickly, um, your leaders will naturally start arising. You will start to see people. You can see this in mob behavior when people are rioting. Um, not that I'm a great expert on that, but you talk to any sort of criminal criminologist, psychologist, people who's look at this, you'll see this. You can see this in the way that riots actually play out in cities. We saw this in the past few years. Uh, you do get, you do get leaders who just, you can call it organically or, or, or just from the masses. There are people you'll, you'll start to see it when, when, when riots first start breaking out. And that's an extreme example because I'm using extreme examples to make the point, Right. Um, not all crowds are riots, but um, but uh, the you know the you'll see leaders sort of organically or maybe just by the will of the people. They'll people are always looking for a sovereign. I guess is my point, and they'll just find one. Whether it's right. a good one is the real question. But you will see this happen. 
Um, when we're talking about political ideologies, though, is what is, I guess, my point. So the the progressive political ideology of this country does not have they, they rally around the ideology. Does it matter? It, it doesn't matter. You, But it doesn't matter because there's there's a real there's a real psychological necessity for humans to look to somebody. Yes, that yes. Right. I so th- there's with the ideology, or the ideology, the ideology, the ideology. Well, Freud. Uh, it's, there's the there's what the I- ideology says, and there's what it does, or rather, there's what people do. do right. Um. There's the that, that that's what I guess what I'm trying to say is right. Like, uh, as as a, as a as 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 well. He's been on my show. So as Elliot, my co-host of my show, would say, you know, um ideology is astrology for intellectuals and it's it's true like it, it it's it's kind of fake but it's also kind of real and then enough people believe in it then it sort of starts to do the stars guide our fate does it matter if enough people believe that they got our fate well then is that kind of real in a way i guess it kind of is and ideology works in a similar way well progressives clearly are anti-authoritarian and are supporting some of the most authoritarian measures that have uh, out there which is very, which is very telling, right? This is something that many people have brought up. This strange thing where you claim to be about flattening hierarchies, you don't like it, but then you want to take all of your political enemies, which say they say claim to not, well, wait, I guess traditionally the left claim to be like, we want to support people and put and help everyone. Now it's like, we want to crush our enemies. It's like, oh, interesting. Um, the friend enemy distinction has reappeared. It never went anywhere. Uh, so these, you know, progressives, the ideology claims they're trying to progress society to some great, great goal. Um, and but the, yet, yet the revolution's never over. So that's interesting. Um, humans are all equal. Yet, very much in Orwellian sense, some are more equal than others. Those can be destroyed. Interesting. Th- these are all hierarchical ideas, but it's just a very destructive hierarchy, is what I'm trying to say. So because like a like a crowd like a mob you attempt you you break down order in a very chaotic and sometimes violent way and then you realize that if you do keep doing that you're going to get eaten now eventually you will get eaten because the revolution always co- consumes itself but you want to stave that off right you want to push the eating away let's push the cannibalism stage away right oh, okay so we need to have some sort of structure and order in our thing in our movement which hates order um and so you get people looking for order and they find it. They find a really gross kind of order that usually results in lots of casualties and other and or other su- human suffering. But only temporarily, you, you only find that leaderless thing for like a split second, Mitch. I would really push back on that. It, it just um, like, for example, up here in the people's the People's Democratic Republic of Chaz Chop during Chaz Chop during the actual Capitol Hill autonomous zone bullshit. Right. There were a lot of crowds in this very Maui Maoist kind of sense of crowds, right? Like of like the power of crowds, the power of people. We are the people. All this stuff. Um, they branded themselves as being very egalitarian, very non-hierarchical, and like within a couple days, or maybe even sooner. I'd actually have some people. I would actually have to do. I forget how long it took. In a very short period of time literal warlords started taking over the Capitol Hill autonomous zone and were handing out AK. This is caught on camera, handing out AK 47s from car trunks and establishing borders through violence or threat of violence. And that's interesting. Like it, it, there was a power vacuum and it was instantly filled by people who did not have the best interest of, of their people at heart, very much their own interest. So a, a hierarchy was almost instantly reestablished, but it was a very negative, bad kind of hierarchy. That's my point. I, I can I can understand what you're mean, what you're talking about. Leaders will obviously emerge, but I guess. But they're the worst kind, is my point, Be- because it's it's the ruthless leaders are the only kind that can make it in that kind of a chaotic uh, ideological setting. Right, but the 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 leaders, the individuals in in these examples from the book. Mm-hmm are very much they are the center of the ideology whereas the ideology of progressivism itself is the center of it is the ideology right it, people people will rise and fall within within progressivism as leaders uh the same i don't think can be said about you know maoism i mean it's called maoism after him for a reason i 
You get Maoist nowadays, though. Right, but he's still the center of it. Is my point? Like, it's one person that's but, the center but, of it. But he was never really that. Well, I guess I'm I'm being sort of, I'm being sort of revisionist here, um, on purpose, and or and I'm also being cheeky. But my point is that like Mao Mao. I guess my my argument is this: is that Mao wasn't the center of Maoism. The god Mao that people created was the center of Mao and is the center of Maoism. The man himself, it's like he's there, but it's almost like he he's like an incarnation of something bigger than him. And this connects thematically to the Mooney bit in the beginning of the book, because it's a similar kind of crazy devotion. It's like, is the is 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 Pastor Moon the one in charge or is it like the divine spirit that has descended upon him that is sort of exemplified in him? That is the, the center of the, of the thing. So does it even matter if he's around? It matters that his name is around and it matters that we all agree that we care and believe a lot about this thing we call moon moon. You know, are we a Mooney? Are we a Maoist? But you hear what I'm saying? Like it, yeah, it's, yeah. It, there's something people are looking continually for transcendence and they find it in like the worst things, right? <laughs> like, please stop trying to find transcendence in insane leader people who make you do horrific things. Cause it's really bad. But humans were like, well, we need something. That's why you can have, you know, neo-Nazis. Well, Nazism was this great, you know, great. It was horrible, but it, in their minds, it was this great project to to build this bizarre, quote unquote, pure, uh, you know, also degenerate uh, society full of drug addicts and vegetarians um, and to wipe people off the face of the earth. Oh, well, we killed Hitler. It doesn't in some ways it doesn't matter. Right. Because you still have people doing saying the thing that i'm not going to say and doing the thing i'm not going to mention right you have mid-century german people all the time doing this and it makes no sense objectively because it's not objective it's a religious kind of experiment it's a very negative religious experiment but it's the same idea it doesn't matter that our leader is dead because we still believe in the vision of our leader and you for me at least the way i make sense of that because it is a bananas thing to say Unless you realize that it's religious, then it starts making perfect sense. Oh, the leader came down from on high or the, you know, the spirit of the divine, the divine wind touched the leader, inspired them to say these things, which in these cases that we've been mentioning so far, this, this, this uh, episode are all like demonic, by the way, but they, so who is inspiring them? Some spirit is coming down and telling them to say something, by the way, not all spirits are good. And then they say it and then they die because humans always die. And you have to, at least I have to, to make sense of the best way I can make sense of it is, is, is to, is to say, well, it doesn't even matter if that person you know, was real or not, although they were, because it really was, it wasn't them. It was like this, they, it was almost people act, treat them like they're an avatar of something bigger, right? Like they're an incarnation of something bigger than themselves. And that's, I think a way, I know that this has devolved very much into a Colin kind of conversation. Apologies. But I think that's a way of that that contextualizes and also connects the Moonies at the beginning of the book and then the Maoists at the, at the end part of the book, because it's it's not even like it's not even about Mao. It's not even about Moon. It's like what they symbolize outside of themselves, the power that they project outside of themselves. I don't know. I think that's a potential connection. Now, whether DeLillo meant that or not, I don't even care because that's yeah. a, that's a connection that I can see there. So. Well, yeah, and who cares what he wanted? That's what we talk well, about. Well, we're, we're, and I'm, and as you know, anyone who's watched my show knows I'm very meta modern in this. It's like, okay, that's what he says. Great. I'll take that into consideration. It's not that I don't care what the author says. It's just, it's not my ultimate interest. My ultimate interest is in what is, what truth, goodness, and or beauty can this novel give me? And I'm, I'm just because it wasn't my favorite thing doesn't mean it's not there. I think that this is an, this is an insight that it was, is giving me. Is it like, it deals with, how crowds interact with that one person, as you point out, their leader and how leaders interact with crowds. And I mean, if you want to keep going, we can, this is what, this is what, this is what book club's all about, right? Gray, Bill Gray. That's not his real name, by the way, which I loved. That's not even his real name. So he's this name. Oh, right, that is right, right. Real. That's a, that's a, that's a pen name. It's an author name, a pen right, name, which is right. normal. For, for authors to do but that's also it's like he's not even himself he's a literal projection of himself 
not his real name. People are waiting for his next book, waiting for his next book, waiting for his next book. That's not even him, man. He might be the, the whoever he actually is might be there typing away, right? And whether he finishes it or not, does it even matter? Because he's the author is he's created a fake version of himself that he gives to the world. And okay, they're going to take his picture. You could say, well, the picture of someone's likeness is slightly more real than a pen, a fake pen name. True. But look at how much effort uh, is being put into how he comes across on the picture, right? The level of detail that a professional photographer goes through in order to put, to, to bring out certain aspects of personality in a still image. Um, this is the same kind of strange projection. It's a literal projection. If has anyone done, you know, if you did high school uh, photography class, right? That's what I kept thinking of because I, right. I did that for like actual film photography because this is back in the 90s. You actually have to project. It's like an actual, it's a literal projection, <laughs> which is then projected metaphorically with reproduction and printing. Um, Because he's not, it's not even him. Like who is, who is this guy? Who is Bill Gray? Right. And, and it's an, it, I also found it interesting and the idea that he didn't want, well, no, they didn't want to actually publish his novel that he's been working for decades yeah. on because that then would then defeat it would, his, his, his persona. It would, it would encapsulate him and to encapsulate, cause then, then you take the sort of the spirit of the thing greater than you and you, and you particularize it too much. And it loses its oomph because now satisfy the crowds wanting by giving them a material thing. And then now they're no longer wanting. Right. And they're no longer coming after you. Because, because, and I think too, there is some, I think that this is something that DeLillo is trying to say that there's, there's a critique there of author of author, of fan, maybe not fandom, but like author obsession. And I mean, that's, I mean, I think I, as somebody who is obsessed with authors, I think it's important to be reminded of this. I'm speaking just for myself here. Like, I really love certain authors. I really just enjoy them. I love what they've done. I love their ideas. But, and I love that they're who they are, right? It's not that I want, you know, I'm not full, I'm not a literal Roland Bart. I don't literally want to destroy authors. But my point is, you, you have to, you have to be reminded of the fact that you love an author because of, what vision they kind of capture and then project to you. But they're not like, like I love Stephen King, even though he has had some very cringe, horrible, horribly cringe political stance. He just had stopped tweeting. I still really enjoy at least early Stephen King. Right. But it is kind of nice to have your heroes da- dashed again to kill your heroes just a little bit. When you see those tweets of his about like, you know, Russia should just get out of Ukraine because it's not theirs. And you're like, Wow. Because you're reminded, oh, he's a real person and he has cringe takes because we all do. And he's a boomer. So he's of a generation, right? As we are also of a generation. He exists in time and space. He is not just his persona. His persona is great, right? The Shining is one of the best novels ever written, I think. But, but, but he's still, he, he's not, he's, he's Stephen King, not Stephen King. Just a case in point, right? Right. Um, and that's important as people, for me at least. And I think, you know, as somebody who I'm very much a fan, I really, the things I enjoy, I very much enjoy. But do I, should I enjoy them because they're what they are? Or should I enjoy them because of what they say about something bigger than themselves? And I think that the latter attitude is a much healthier kind of attitude to have. Uh, you know, you, you get people, I've had, I'm not, I'm not fighting with you about this, but I've fought with people about like, you know, it's okay to be a fan. It's okay to like things. It's actually good to like things. It shows you have passion for something bigger than yourself, but don't let those things you love become the ultimate passion in your life, right? There should be something transcendent and something created by a dude, a person, anybody is going to be finite and temporal. So, and that leads directly into the second theme because, uh, you know, so the, the last thing I, I wanted to take away from this book. Sorry, apologies for the, the long rant, but this is, I mean, <laughs> you assigned me this reading, sir. So I was, I was thinking about things I would say, and that was one thing I thought I could say. So no, I uh, very much appreciate it. Um, this, this idea that novelists have become subservient to media, right? Yeah. So. Again, this was written in the 90s, and DeLillo has been called uh, a, a soothsayer by, by some. Yeah. yeah. 
because in white noise, for example, uh, it, it, one of the plot points uh, surrounds this pill that people take and the pill was uh, time release. And so he, in the novel, he very nicely describes how this time release pill works, but this was way before time release medication existed. Right. And so he had some knowledge and some, some foresight into thinking, Oh, we could create this. And then, you know, 10 years later, it was actually created. I think he's doing the same thing here where he's talking about media is becoming our entertainment. He, he, he couches it in the term terrorism because that's what yeah, well, I was going to say. Time. And the connection between media and violence. Right. Right. And political violence. Right. Is, is notable. But, yeah. but the idea that he, he's evoking that politics is becoming our entertainment. And oh, yeah. that's, that has come, become very clear in the last five to six years. I think but he become, wrote this in 1990. Yeah. I think it's become clear for certain people. I think for people like, like us, it be, it's very self-evident that politics is entertainment. I mean, but but I have said to like boomers, uh, particularly and X and just and other and other millennials. Let's be honest, like uh, that, like oh, I don't really follow sports. I just do politics. That's my sports. And they kind of look at me weird. I'm like, it's actually more exciting. And it actually affects your everyday life more than who wins that game, because this is like public policy and things like that. And I'm always I, I always like I try to have like a pregnant pause and then I'm, I try to be quick to say, I'm not happy that it is this way. I'm just saying this is what it is. And so I have to care. I'd prefer to actually care about who wins the Seahawks game. But the problem is, is that what King County votes on really affects my life more, right? Like the Seahawks game it can make Seattle traffic bad. But what King County decides can, about like health policy can decide whether you have a job or not. By the way, I'm referencing real things. If anyone knows, it just, you know, any of the past three years, look at look at what regional health authorities have been able to do with your life. Like that's a... Yeah, I have to care. Um, it is also exciting. But yeah, isn't that a shame that politics is so exciting? Why does politics have to be exciting? Well, because it's a media product that's given to right. you and saying, right. here you go. Here's your team. They're good. Here's the other team. They're bad. And while they may one time, you know, there might be one team is better than the other. You're like, yeah, but I mean, we're they're all kind of on nasty people. But you you. Have your t- you have your colors, you have your songs, you have your your chants, right? You have your you have your uh, your merch, right? You have your you got to have the merch. Yeah. As much as I like him, you got to buy the new Vivek Ramaswamy T shirt because <laughs> are you even really support? You see what I mean? I'm like this is, it, yeah. Um, I want to read two short paragraphs from the Please. novel to to illustrate the point that he's making here. Uh, so this first one is, uh, as the, the photographer Britta is her name is taking his picture. Uh, this is toward the beginning of the novel, but they're having this conversation as she's taking his picture, kind of deep conversation. And Bill Gray, so the, the novelist says, there's a curious knot that binds novelist and terrorists. In the West, we become famous effigies of our books. Sorry, we become famous effigies as our books lose power to shape and influence. Do you ask your writers how they feel about this? Years ago, I used to think it was possible for a novelist to alter the inner life of the culture. Now, bomb makers and gunmen have taken that territory. They make raids on human consciousness. What writers used to do before we all were incorporated. Pretty cynical interesting way to put that i think and the second one and and i'll get your reaction after the second one so the second one is um the character scott who is kind of like quoting what bill would say about novelists so it says quote uh the novel used to feed our search for meaning it was a great secular transcendence the latin mass of language character occasional new truth but our desperation has led us towards something larger and darker. So we turn to the news, which provides an unremitting mood of catastrophe. This is where we find emotional experience not available elsewhere. We don't need the novel. We don't even need catastrophes necessarily. We only need the reports and predictions and warnings. 
that I think is the most quintessential example yes. of, of his point. Yeah, and I think it's spot on. Um, I think, well, I mean, this is a thing I'm actually kind of trying to start working on. A, I have a, I have a writing project I kind of want to start 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 on, and this does connect, I promise. Um, because I don't know, are you a fan of, are you a fan of the Pixies? No. Okay. Do you know who they are? No. Okay. Sort of like um, 80s alternative. Okay. Um, th- their most famous song was made was made quite famous because of the movie. It's used in the movie Fight Club, Where Is My Mind? You've probably heard that song before. Probably. Um, in their other music, which I think are, is actually, their other songs, which are better, there's a, there's sort of this interesting, particularly in the Doolittle album, um, there's a real strong tendency in their music, uh, at least in that album lyrics, to talk. It's all extremely extra end of the world kind of apocalyptic revelation style imagery um it's it's also it's i i contend that their stuff is very similar to john milton's paradise lost in this respect why am i bringing this up aside from thing it's something i'm interested in because you find this throughout popular culture modern popular culture postmodern popular culture maybe is the better way of saying it there is a real need to have an end of something there is a real need for a catastrophe there's a real need to have apocalypse now. There's a real need. To, great movie, by the way. There, there needs to be the end, right? Jim Morrison said this is the end, also used in that movie. Like, and and, and okay, that's far too 1960s and 70s, Colin. Okay, well, what about climate change and the end of civilization and the end of low lying areas and the end of being able to walk around without a mask on. There is no new norm. There is no normal. The end of everything. It's the end of everything. It's the end of everything because humans desperately need to think about the end because we are all mortal. And so we are obsessed with the end and we don't get, you know, it, like in from, from, from the, the bits you read, you, you don't have the mass. You don't have, you don't have to be Catholic to see the point, right? You don't have a religious tradition anymore, really. You don't have a traditional religious tradition, but you instantly, that void is instantly filled by 24 hour news cycle mm-hmm. in the nineties, right? Now it's like Twitter feeds, social media, which is even somehow even it's, it's 24 seven, but somehow even more, right? Um, because humans need that. And the point about novelists not being able to break into the noise, uh, break through that noise, I think is, 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 is a great point because a novel tries to particularize and work its work out one kind of aspect of life. I think if it's a good novel, right. And maybe it's more than one aspect, but it's like a good novel. The ones novels that people really love and remember try to do something like that. Usually I think, but how are you supposed to compete? And I don't know if you can compete. I think that the, the, it's a cynical point. How are you supposed to compete? Um, I don't know if you can. I think I would say something like stop playing that game. That game is not, you're not going to win. that. It's an unwinnable game. Um, but I don't think the Lillo leaves us with that point of, well, just have you tried not playing it? I think it's just sort of like a, it's a very ni- early nineties kind of take of like, isn't this sucky that we can't compete in this anymore? I mean, which is fine, right? It's a normal, that's a natural kind of response to, realizing what media is or maybe that's what media has is becoming or maybe that's what media always was but it's definitely becoming apparent that like it's inescapable and it's media is not art i think is also one of the points there right from of the book and particularly as exemplified in those quotes that you read media is not art right literature is art but media is not art it's it's noise it's it's there's art media if if art shows up in media it's always repurposed by media for something else and right. and to yeah to, to bring it's this... not like war and peace is a great novel it's so beautiful it's like how can we merchant how can we make a a, a, a 16 part spin-off series that we can merchant you know it's like yeah that's media right like right you know that's it's it's not about the thing itself it's about what we can do with it it's media is very um instrumentalizing right media looks at things it, media wants to looks at art and sees and thinks what it could get out of it how can we turn this to use it for political purposes how can we turn to use it for profit purposes can we sell something with this and to bring that to the the very end of the novel and and we can sort of end on this note i think the the last 
the epilogue, if you will, uh, it's called In Beirut, I believe. We see one of the main characters, Britta, the photographer, who has, I'm sure this was not lost on you, it was it's very subtly introduced, but she's gone from photographing um, artists, right, novelists, to now media, right? Now her job is... Uh, well, she's photographing terrorists. Well, yeah, but but specifically, um, not just the terrorists, but specifically, like al- almost like the war torn country, right? The war torn yeah. city of Beirut. So, right. but it's very much more a media, you know, uh, slant than an artistic slant. So, right. the the death of the novelist, literally, right? Bill Gray dies, and now figuratively, uh, the the woman who was obsessed with with taking photographs of of the novelist is now having to photograph uh, newsworthy stuff um, because and it, it seems she's very much unhappy, right? He Again, DeLillo doesn't say that she's unhappy, but you can sort of tell that she's not happy anymore. And uh, she's been sort of having, ha- she's been forced into this life because uh, and probably because it's more lucrative for her to maybe make a living. Um, but I think that was a very poignant way of ending the the novel because as i said before he unsubtly hits you over the head with the themes over and over and over again but in that last section i think he very subtly taps you over the head with it one more time Oop. yeah no, that's, that's a nice a good... closing to his novel yeah it is no it, it it's it's a, you know and i think as we're talking about it now and particularly as i'm hearing you talk about it i think i'm appreciating it more i think it's it is one of those things where Sometimes something doesn't strike joy initially with you, and but then when you talk to somebody who really cares about it, maybe it's still not your number one favorite thing. But it you can kind of see through someone's appreciation of that work, you can start to appreciate it more. Which I would say is a hallmark of art and not media, because media is not like that, right? Media isn't even one thing. It's a strange munching crawling chaos kind of devouring egregore um collective something that chews up stuff and spits out other things and it unpredictably moves in different ways and it doesn't it doesn't strive for beauty it strives for consumption i guess um so well uh for our next book for the month of december we will be reading a book that Colin has chosen. I'm very excited I'll, about this. I'll let, I'll let you give a little uh, introduction to that if people want to read along, and we'll have our next episode at the end of December. Yeah, I'm very excited. Thank you, Mitch, for um, for letting me. I, I feel it's a bit like I'm assigning it for you. I, uh, I, I hope you'll like it. Um, we're going to be discussing A Clockwork Orange. Um, many people have seen the movie. I do recommend the movie. The movie is great in its own way. I'm a huge Kubrick fan, but... The book is outstanding because the um, it's not written in our version of English. It's written in a f- a constructed future slang, um, and the book I won't even talk about the book's about, but the book teaches you this variety of English that doesn't exist in the real world as you read it, um, and so you end up kind of there's an interesting uh, meta commentary on language itself and. What does that maybe have to do with our modern world or current situation? Linguistic programming. Um, so, so you know, tune in to the next episode. Tune in. Yeah, too. linguistic programming. What is it to? How does language affect the way you think? Does it affect the way you think? Is that even a thing? Yeah. Um, also, you know, larger, more important questions like what is it to be good and what is it to be evil? Uh, but yeah, um, if you do read it, recognize that it's one of the most violent. Th- stories i've ever read um it, there's a lot of ultra violence uh in it it's um there's rough passages let's say uh so if just the, not that we're big about trigger warnings here but i will just say that like there's a <laughs> there were moments in that book where i was like wow that is maybe the, one of the most profane things i've ever read in my life but um yeah well, okay. Be forewarned. Uh, Be and forewarned. I I'm you should still read it. I've never read this book either, so I'm interested to read it. 
Um, great. So yeah, join us in our next episode. Uh, it'll come out at the end of the month of December and please read along with us and, uh, disagree or agree with us as, as you feel you need to. Yeah. You actually should disagree with me. And most of the time you probably, nobody should really agree with me because that's boring. So don't do that. But for now we'll shelve Mao too and see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>